This is the Wiggers diagram. And although it looks pretty complicated, it's a pretty handy tool because it shows you each part of the cardiac cycle and how they line up with each other in any given time frame. So this top part is looking at pressure of a couple different areas in your heart. You have pressure in the aorta, shown by this top red line, pressure in the left atria, shown by this bottom red line, and left ventricular pressure, shown by this black line. The next part of the graph is showing ventricular volume. So this basically shows you how much blood is in the ventricles at any given time. The next section is your ECG, your electrocardiogram, and it shows where your P wave, QRS complex, and T wave occur at different times. Your heart sounds are shown in the next part, and then the bottom shows a nice pectoral representation of what your heart looks like. And it's easier to see in this picture when systole occurs in the atria and when systole occurs in the ventricles and so forth. So we're going to start with this blue, this dark blue section right here. In this area, we've just finished one cardiac cycle. So the ventricles, if we go to this last picture, the ventricles have already ejected all of their blood. They are relaxed. And at this point, your AV valves or your atrioventricular valves are open. Now, all this time, while the ventricles were contracting, the atria were continuing to fill with blood. Unlike other areas of the heart, like right here, but guarding the way between the atria and the ventricles, and then again guarding the way between the ventricles and the arteries, you have valves guarding the way. But there's no valves guarding between veins and atria. So blood from the vena cava continues to fill the right atrium constantly and blood being returned from the lungs through the pulmonary veins continues to fill the left atrium. So when you finally have these atrioventricular valves open, all the blood that was collecting in the atria can now passively just fall into the ventricles just through gravity. So initially you have this rapid filling part. And that's just because the blood that's collected in the atria falls down into the ventricles relatively quickly. After that, it continues to fill as blood is returned from the veins to the atria and then from the atria into the ventricles, but it happens a little bit more slowly. And that slower filling is called diastasis. If we look up at our heart sounds, you have S3, which is kind of hard to hear sometimes. It's not one of the major lub or dub sounds. Uh, and this is just because as the ventricles are expanding with blood very quickly, you may not see, um, it, it may make a sound as those ventricles open up and get all that blood in them. You can see in our ECG, everything's in diastole, all of our chambers are at rest. The ventricular volume, as that blood goes into the ventricles, you see more blood enter the ventricles. So this is just graphically showing more blood goes in the ventricles. Up here, if we look at pressure, aortic pressure is ma maintaining uh, a steady pressure. Left ventricular pressure is still pretty low. Although it's continuing to fill with blood, it's still holding steady and pretty much the same for left atrial pressure. As we move on, we get the P wave. Now the P wave stands for, uh, or is indicative of atrial depolarization. And depolarization is the cause of systole. So since the P wave is for atrial, systole, atrial depolarization, we see, down here in our picture, atrial systole. So you see the atria contracting, and any extra blood that may have been in the atria at that time moves into the ventricles. And if we follow up, you can see the ventricles are already quite filled with blood. They have a large volume already, but the atria as they go through systole will contribute a little bit more. You can also see there's a little bit of a pressure bump briefly, both from in the left ventricle and in the left atria. So as those atria squeeze, they contract, they're going through systole, they'll squeeze a little bit extra blood, the pressure goes up, uh, and then as the ventricles receive that blood, it goes up a little bit too. Now, after atrial depolarization, you have atrial repolarization. But because you have this giant QRS monstrosity in the way, 
uh, atrial repolarization is hidden, but it would occur somewhere in here. And atrial repolarization causes atrial diastole. So the atria relax at this point. And if you look at our next picture here, you can see the atria are in their relaxed state. After atrial repolarization, you have ventricular depolarization. And that is shown by this QRS complex right here. That's your atri sorry, your ventricular depolarization. Depolarization causes systole. So ventricular depolarization, you see ventricular systole. However, you are not going to move any blood out of the ventricles just yet. And that's because these valves, both the atrioventricular valves and the semilunar valves, they're only going to open if you have a big enough pressure difference on either side of the valves. There's a brief period of time where the ventricles are in systole and they contract, but there's not enough pressure built up in the ventricles to push open the semilunar valves. But they are contracting enough to cause the atrioventricular valves to close. So at this point in time, all four valves are closed, which means no blood can move out of the ventricles. So that's why this period is called isovolumetric contraction. Iso means same. Volumetric is referring to volume of blood. So the ventricles are contracting, but you have the same amount of blood in them. Nothing can move. And as you look at the timeline here, you can see it's a very brief period of time, but you do have a short time where you have ventricular systole, but no blood is moving. When those atrioventricular valves close, because of all of the blood turbulence and the tension of the cordy tendine, you get your S1 heart sound. And this is the traditional lub that you hear in the lub dub. Um, so S1 is due to um, mainly the, the blood turbulence that surrounds your AV valves closing. If we look up at our ECG, we see we've got QRS. And also, we have our end diastolic volume. So this is looking at how much volume is in the ventricles. You can see we're, we're, we're topped off right here. End diastolic volume. This was referring to how much blood is in your ventricles at the end of diastole. So right before the ventricles undergo systole, right before they contract, how much blood is in your ventricles at the very end of diastole? So basically, this is the maximum possible amount of blood in your ventricles. End diastolic volume and end systolic volume both are referring to how much blood is in the ventricles. If we look at pressure, we see that as the ventricles are contracting, this black line that's showing left ventricular pressure is going way up. And that makes sense. They're completely filled with blood. They're squeezing. That heart muscle is contracting. Um, and especially before we have any blood moving out, you have quite a lot of pressure that's being built up. And remember, we need to build up enough pressure in order to force open those semilunar valves that, that are guarding the way into the aorta and the pulmonary artery or the pulmonary trunk. So pressure continues to increase. And although you have a brief period where all four valves are closed, we have isovolumetric contraction, we quickly move into ventricular ejection. And this is where the ventricles are ejecting blood out into the arteries. So the right ventricle ejects blood into the pulmonary artery, and the left ventricle ejects blood into the aorta. And they'll have to go through that pulmonary semilunar valve and the aortic semilunar valve in order to do that. So blood is now moving. Notice the AV valves are still closed tight. So blood moves out from the ventricles into the artery, as we look at what's going on in other areas, we don't have any other heart sounds just yet. Um, and you can see the T wave coming up toward the end. That will be ventricular repolarization, and it will be the cause 
of ventricular diastole in just a second. You can see as that blood is ejected, your volume in your ventricles goes down. So that makes sense as blood is leaving the ventricles and moving into an artery. If we look at our pressures, you can see your atrial pressure is holding relatively steady. Since the AV valves are closed, they're continuing to fill with blood and that blood will just collect in the atria. So you can see it slowly start to go up for that reason. Ventricular pressure, this black line is going to be very high, obviously, as you have the ventricle squeezing. Starts to go down a little bit as you start getting more and more of that blood out of the ventricle and into the arteries, though. This red line is showing the aortic pressure, and it makes sense. As you are moving blood from the ventricle, the left ventricle, into the aorta, you're going to have a lot of pressure. The left ventricle, you may remember, is extremely muscular. It's pretty easy to tell the left ventricle from the right ventricle. If you cut into it and look at how thick the, the muscle is in that heart wall, the left ventricle pumps with a huge amount of force. Uh, because it has to be able to pump blood throughout the entire systemic circuit. And that first stop is the aorta. So lots of pressure in the aorta. That blood continues to move on through the arteries. Volume leaves the ventricles. We're going to come back and revisit our T wave. The T wave is indicative of ventricular repolarization. And that will cause ventricular diastole. Notice the lineups of these. You see diastole occurring just after the T wave. Also systole occurs just after the start of QRS. They're not totally simultaneous. The ECG waves are the signal for the systole and diastole, but they're not synonymous. So the T wave, you get the repolarization signal through the ventricles, and this will cause diastole. So here in the purple right here, we see the start of ventricular diastole. And so if we look at what the heart looks like, you can see that your valves are now closed. Again, blood is going to continue to fill the atria. There's no valves blocking the way, returning blood from veins into each atrium. The ventricles have been mostly emptied of the blood. If we come back and look at our ventricular volume graph, you can see right here at the end of the purple, we have end systolic volume. This is how much blood is left in the ventricles at the very end of systole, so right before diastole starts. Uh, and you'll notice it's not zero. So, and then how much blood you moved out of the ventricle, so the difference between your end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, that is your stroke volume. So how much blood actually made it out of the ventricles is your stroke volume. But you will still have a little bit. You won't be able to move out every single drop of blood. So the remainder at the end of ventricular systole is called your end systolic volume. Now, as those ventricles relax, you have the closure of these valves. As the pressure in the arteries, your pulmonary artery and your aorta, becomes great, as we've just moved a ton of blood into those arteries, as the pressure in your arteries overcomes that in the ventricles, that pressure difference causes your valves to close, your semilunar valves. If we come up here and go revisit our pressure diagram, you can see at the beginning of diastole, you have a little notch right here. And this is occurring as your semilunar valves close. There's so much force uh, of the blood entering the aorta that as those semilunar valves close, there's actually a rebound of the blood off of the aortic valve. And so it causes this little notch that's called the dichrotic notch. And it's just due to the rebound of blood as the semilunar valves close. And the semilunar valves closing makes our other heart sound, S2. So heart sound S2 is your dub 
in our lub dub. S2 is caused by closure of the semilunar valves. As we continue onward, we're starting all over again. So if you notice, this next section is dark blue, just like where we started. You can see everything is in diastole. We're not yet to the next P wave. Um, and we start a new cardiac cycle. So this entire process takes less than a second um, from beginning to end, and that's all the events surrounding atrial systole and diastole, as well as ventricular systole and diastole. So I hope this helped you line everything up. Uh, it may be helpful for you to practice with just the pictures of the heart and try to match on your own, on a, just a piece of paper, around where do you think the volume would be at each stage of the cardiac cycle. Would it make sense that you have a lot of volume in the ventricles at this time or not much volume? Are the valves open or closed? If the AV valves recently closed, that's your S1 sound that you'll see. If your semilunar valves just closed, then you're gonna see your S2 sound. And if you're able to talk yourself through this diagram uh, and understand what all the lines are showing you at each different point in time, then you'll have a pretty good grasp on the cardiac cycle.